Oh my god, it's George Kamatani. Gradriel, look out! About four years ago, I played through Dragon's Crown to see what the deal was, liked it okay, and left Vanillaware's entire catalog alone, satisfied with what I played. So, guess we can call young me a fabulously charming and well-spoken individual. Vanillaware's games are incredible, almost universally, but man, they suffer. Inconsistent platform releases, inconsistent regional availability, material that's really easily noticed and dragged by outlets without any consideration for the aesthetic lineage informing it. They're the works of a team with clear artistic sensibilities and obvious opinions about the gaming medium. Decadent, decorated plays, and always worth your time. This video only covers half the material, from Princess Crown, not even a Vanillaware game, to Dragon's Crown, once its intended sequel released over 15 years later. This is the one about the side-scrollers. It's gonna be a bit of a walk to the finish, as you might expect. The follow-up video will include the RPG and strategy titles, but for those curious, the games on offer in this specific four-game lineage are all directed by George Kamatani, and only half of the games in the second portion can claim as much. It's an interesting history. And frankly, the reason this video matters at all is Princess Crown. It's the unsung progenitor of the entire Vanillaware 2D side-scroller lineage, and since it precedes Vanillaware proper, we pan to its director, George Kamatani. I know, leads take too much credit. I get it. People make studios, make games, make directors' careers, but in the case of Vanillaware, the director's at the heart of the story. A young George Kamatani gets hooked on games and tricks his parents into buying him a computer to improve his math grades. The interviewer calls this a common story. I raise an eyebrow. Kamatani's early work involves part-time pixel art creation in his first year of high school. The job had Kamatani recreating adult images underaged, you know, as one does, but also AD&D Hills Far, slugging away at the pixel art by hand for the Famicom version. By the time he graduates from high school, he sends out applications to major gaming companies for all kinds of positions, and ends up working for Capcom. He animates for Saturday Night Slam Masters, known in Japan as Muscle Bomber, The Body Explosion, a pretty interactive wrestling-type proto-fighter, and that experience becomes the basis for Vanillaware's 2D animation tools, and probably heavily influenced Kamatani's combat ethos. He also works, notably, on Dungeons & Dragons, Tower of Doom, a classic side-scrolling beat-em-up. But he leaves Capcom feeling stifled and joins a small development team that, while previously working on adult games, pivots to consumer titles, and so Kamatani gets his chance. Princess Crown, Kamatani's first project, begins as a game like Princess Maker 2. So like, kinda weird, but morphs into an RPG, essentially on a whim, uh, to suit the market landscape. Uh, this is an RPG, right? Oh yeah, man, totally. It's got numbers and levels and, and all of that. That's not even an exaggeration. <laughs> Come on, man. The small studio goes bankrupt, Kamatani shops the funless project around, Atlas picks it up, Princess Crown releases, lands at the tail end of the Sega Saturn's lifespan, achieves critical acclaim, inspiring thousands, and sells like absolute sh Just total utter sh causing Atlas Kansai to close its doors with Kamatani effectively blacklisted from the industry. There's no joke here, that really happened. Princess Crown dropped in 1997, and Vanillaware's suspiciously similar project, Odin Sphere, released in 2007, 10 years apart. But we'll dig into the history again between entries. For now, let's crack the book on Kamatani's doomed passion project, the mother of all Vanillaware. Princess Crown is the greatest game on the Sega Saturn, and while that may be a lie, I felt joy saying it, making it true and beautiful anyway. Princess Crown is a Japanese-language-only action RPG released in 1997 exclusively for the Sega Saturn. Its influence on video games as a medium is undeniable, and it directly informs later Vanillaware projects while generally being ignored by Western game folk writ large because no English patch exists. Maybe you think that's all a stretch. And respectfully, you'd be wrong when I say it influenced video games as a medium. I mean that Princess Gradriel has a figurine, despite the game selling like trash. 
I mean that a character directly inspired by Princess Greydriel appears in La Pucelle Tactics. I mean that Princess Greydriel appears in Etrian Odyssey. I'd argue she's the inspiration behind Yggdra and Alyssa of the Department Heaven games. This character design has been preserved through decades. I plugged her palette into the thumbnail, bro, because Princess with Sword is f awesome. I swear if the game did well, her design would have rivaled Mario, Sonic, all the other greats in Ubiquity, and I'm not kidding. It's immaculate. I will literally fight you about this. Unfortunately, the only way for a monolingual anglophone to play involves a usable translation PDF available below, though it's absolutely rife with intent-altering jokes, and I get it. I've been there. On the internet, you only have a few minutes of most people's time at best probably seconds nowadays. But take, for example, this convo where our knight friend here has a fairly average conversation with a fairy in-game, but in the translation he's... like he's gonna do what? Huh? Or alternatively, you can use the long play linked below by this charming guy. What's the rumpus, Tommy? I'm here doing my princess crown thing. This is why YouTube owns. Now, I recommend the funny PC version that doesn't exist instead of buying an import. It was made available on the PSP and PS4 as well, again, only in Japanese, and the PSP edition is crisp and accessible if you know what you're doing and you've got your handy guide. Playing games this way is new to me. I've never really bothered for long with things I can't perfectly understand, and I did it for the sake of joy. I saw a screenshot, the sprites looked cool, I tried it out, and I discovered this magical little piece of history buried under the one inch deep layer of taking the time to care. And I'm so glad I did. Man, games are getting so expensive. Devs are being laid off constantly. Even Riot Games and Blizzard staffers, man. And tech fetishizing publishers are pushing for AI and NFT integration on top of the already established industry ills of monetization and live service titles. Games that never end. But old games? Old games can't betray you. What? the f just happened. This is why emulation is important. Fragments of history would be lost without it. Collecting is a privilege, both in having the space and capital to do so, and I think access to art is more important, certainly for the sake of preservation, than maintaining good boy points by having to buy a region-locked Sega Saturn, or just a functioning one with an action replay card, or the PSP version, which isn't region-locked for your dying hardware, <laughs> etc., etc. Groceries and rent come first, just get the game and play. Not that I would ever do any of that. We're two seconds in and I've seen enough. This is the most beautiful thing in video games. Look at the baby! They didn't need to include a little hub room where different books function as different playable characters, but they did, and it's everything. Princess Crown is pretty simple to explain. It's the story of a girl put on the throne far too young who picks up a sword and goes to see and solve the problems in her kingdom. Yo, solving problems with swords, that's my favorite thing! It's really not much deeper than that. The game's story may be long and winding, but the core is simple. Finding yourself and your place in the world by getting out and doing. It's a lesson I think everyone should learn, so whether or not you can read the text, you can take something away regardless. You're given a rambling combat tutorial and eventually sneak out into the world and buddy, I'm hankering for a good goddamn princess adventure. Princess Crown is set in a lavish fantasy wonderland, the vibrant foliage rife with heart-shaped fruit. You'll see a lot of different places over the course of a play, and they range from whimsical to grounded to urban to nightmarish. The aesthetic lineage may be rooted in fantasy, but it's not Tolkien-esque, exactly, and more akin to something like Alice in Wonderland. In an interview with Glixel, Kamatani mentions being influenced by various artists throughout the years. The mangaka Akira Kagami's early work with its softer, more feminine style that you can tell he adopted in his own work. He also mentions John Tenniel, who illustrated Alice in Wonderland, which probably accounts for some of the general aesthetic whimsy. What the heck? Heart-shaped fruits? Was Kamatani on drugs or something? Did he hoot a reefer cigarette? <laughs> <laughs> Look at this Mad Hatter looking merchant. Ew! Dodo birds are fought alongside crowned tarantulas. There's a shrimp headed lady. I. I know Kamatani doesn't know me. But for every jerk off who ever got mad that I tried to take things lightly and tell little jokes and have fun, I think he'd see the vision. 
I have to believe in the heart of the whims. You can trace the value of a work in its imperfections and quirks, its texture, details, and idiosyncrasies, which more or less sums up Kamatani's entire approach. I have to take a minute to talk about the animation and art direction, especially for anyone who's not big on old games. Oh, that animation is so sick. For a game of this era, Princess Crown is like Omega swag, to put it lightly. It's jaw-dropping, bursting with color, flair, and character. I know. Okay, Kamatani, very funny, but also she teleports by exploding into chunks. Every person, every monster is lovingly animated, enough that I'm sure it obliterated the budget. NPC models are reused frequently, and what else do you expect? They animated as much as they could, including having NPCs peer up or down at Great Reel. Such incredible attention to detail. It's a living, breathing painting from 97. Half the draw is the spectacle. I don't want to call too much attention to the music, I think it does a fine job of selling a fantasy world, but what really stuck with me was the town theme. Because it's a jaunty little track you hear probably too many times with very few bars before it loops, but the loop reaches a climax where someone clearly, a child maybe, screams to denote the reset, and it's permanently stuck in my brain now. They put Chrono in the game. You move from place to place, traversing little pathways, occasionally stopped by random battles. Combat is pretty easy early on. I'm sorry, comment, honey, why, why is that? You get immersed very quickly, walk in and kill, with no fast travel in the early game, a punchy combat system, and so many colorful locales to explore, you become meaningfully situated in the game's world. With every slain enemy, you acquire an item, and your pockets begin to overflow. With every level, you inch one step closer to the vision of Gridreal's mother, the queen, seen in the intro. I think it's masterful at adapting that classically RPG vibe of dungeon survivalism. If you've ever played a long Final Fantasy dungeon on low MP and items and can understand what I'm talking about, except this game's particular systems make it hit so much harder. Let me explain. Anyone who's played long RPGs knows that getting good with resource management, pushing exactly how far you can extend before retreating and healing, is one of the joys of the genre. The palpable crunch of the numbers and the risk inherent to playing with them. The player goes through similar trials in Princess Crowns, stranded in long runs between towns, depthy, complex dungeons, limited inventory space, and sometimes lethal encounters. But because every fight is a 1v1, because you have to be active and intentional in every battle, the play is much more engaging than some classic turn-based titles could ever be. It mechanically conveys the narrative weight of a princess, with no experience, picking up a sword and marching out into the world. Minimal training, only the items you've scrounged, and zombies are dropping super moves! If you can appreciate games on a narrative level, it's incredible. But that's a surface level look at the play, and like someone said somewhere, it's fuzzy and I forget, play is onions. It's got layers, unfunny Shrek reference, shoot my whole head off. One of the first things Princess Crown tells you is that good adventure should use consumable items a lot. Which is true if Diablo is anything to go by. Dude, really? You're seriously trying to unpack 30 years of damage here, Kamatani? Okay, how about you let me live, okay? You don't know my life! Consumables are frustrating in games. They were made for a reason, and gamers turn their backs. Endless items ignored in inventories, and the world just f yeah. watched. But here, you will be overburdened. Your pockets packed with stuff, unless you go ahead and use it. You pick up all kinds of things, from equipment, to food, to bottles, for potion making, to magical staves, gemstones, scrolls, frying pans! If you're playing without a translation or guide, you're in for some trouble. It's not immediately obvious what everything does, so it pays to do your homework. Bottles can combine with gemstones, changing them into consumable spellcasting items. There's no other real magic option for Great Reel aside from staves, scrolls, and gems, so you'll want to keep a few for an instant cast panic button. Yo, Marvel! <coughs> By the way, Kamatani worked on Darkstalkers, in case you were confused about that. They're really worth investing in. Some provide healing, some make meteors or lightning, and come affixed with invincibility frames. They can swing whole encounters in your favor, and because they're consumable, they never detract from the sword, the baseline, the symbol of Greydriel's resolve. Some food is immediately consumable, but not all. Fish, meat, and eggs should ideally be combined with a pan or pot item or 
brought to an inn for cooking service, turning them into the best recovery items in the game. Warm food hits different. Sure, fruits have multiple charges and a girl's got a snack, but all fried foods increase your maximum health a little bit with each bite, meaning cooking and eating is a means of leveling up external to the experience system. Princess Crown is a very early example of Kamatani's decadent artistic principles. In an interview for Gaman Guy, he quips, Eating is one of the three human desires. If one eats, he is happy. I don't know if eating in a game would make one happy, but I hoped maybe it would. Just a little. Kamatani's words imply that at least some level of dopamine release, or less precisely, making players happy intentionally is key to his strategy. I couldn't find what three specific desires he was referencing. We can assume wealth and carnal desire based on inductive reasoning like how every battle in Princess Crown yields a treasure chest. Decadence, indulgence plays a large role in every vanillaware game, and these are the origins. Cooked food, piles of treasure and consumables, and dude, look at Boobella. No, not that Boobella. The other Boobella. Boobellas. They're multiplying. Kamatani's been on the sharp end of some pointed criticism regarding his depiction of women in games. Sometimes valid, sometimes not so much, especially with the Dragon's Crown Frank Frazetta connection. But at the very least, Princess Crown's protagonist looks cool and doesn't have that kind of appeal because she's a badass, sword swanging actual child, like 13 years old. So please, please do not lose the. <laughs> so Greydrill is made to fight her evil future self at one point, who's really cool because she's clearly using magical gemstones to cast spells and doesn't use the sword at all, meaning she failed to live up to her mother's shining example and lost sight of her true self, symbolically taking the easy path of tyrannical laziness, casting the sword aside and casting with consumables, and not even innate and learned magic. Amazing characterization that defeats any kind of criticism about, say, the bizarre urge to loot a character who we only really know as a child. After beating her evil self, you can tap into that power with the triggers, fire off spells at the cost of HP, solidifying the criticism that Kamatani looked at a 13-year-old Greydrill and said, what if? Add to the food and magic a slew of throwable weapons and other utility items, and Princess Crown can be surprisingly scrappy in the RPG sense. You access a ring menu like Secret of Mana, and the game freezes for spell casts. It's like I'm back home. It's like I never left. The real game, the bulk of the experience, is played within Sword's Reach. Princess Crown is sometimes called an action game, an action RPG, a side-scrolling beat-em-up, lots of labels, but in reality, it's a duel simulator. Every single fight is fought 1v1, minus the goblin packs and game grumps, I guess, who tag in and out, but the vibe is maintained regardless. When the game calls for combat, one person is leaving, and to roll credits, that means Greydrill wins every time. You get pretty good by the end. Greydrill has more going on than you might expect. You can mash out a slash combo, you can hold the button to do a sort of super attack that also works as an anti-air option, you can do a rising attack and mash to make the fairy cover you, you can hold down and attack to thrust, you can jump, jump attack, guard, you can hold a button to ready a dash so when an enemy attack is on the way, the game freezes and lets you dash either way. You've got a lot of choices and it's very empowering. In fact, this is kind of weird. It almost feels like a... <laughs> This is a fighting game. Combat is surprisingly sharp and precise. Not fighting game-esque exactly, your aerial slash leaves you airborne during the attack and you can't combo off a jump in, but it's much more exciting than it looks. Every fight feels relevant, not just because you have to be deliberate and actually kind of understand frame data implicitly. And if you don't, you can seriously pay for it. Oh, no, I'm in recovery frames. No! But because enemies can just do things. Insane things you've never seen. The number of times I went, oh, I've never seen that move before, is way too high for a game from this era. It's endlessly surprising. Why the frog got an ultra combo? It's not even super cheesable like you'd expect. I'm always fishing for dirty player options, but the best I could do was stun slower enemies with repeated dash attacks, only later in the game, bigger dudes started leaping out, becoming invincible through spammed attacks, and yeah, Good call, Kamatani. Uh, half the fun is the enemies. Just seeing what crazy animation they cooked up for whatever meaningless throwaway jobber. 
Oh, ew! What the f- Sometimes old enemies get new moves. The goblins can mug your ass if you're not careful and get caught in the wrong neighborhood. Caught in recovery frames, which will drop some of your items. And believe me, in a game where eating cooked food increases your max health, and you always want some of that on hand, suddenly seeing all your food on the floor drives you into panic mode instantly. Maximum blood pressure! Don't touch my stuff! Exploration is fun. Visiting detailed new towns is neat. Combat whips, and you're always getting stronger. Quest by quest, there's actually a whole slew of side quests that aren't mandatory for beating the game, but will help you get stronger if you're not great at combat, something Kamatani made sure of in every action game he's worked on. The only real issue with Princess Crown is, outside of combat and whimsy, there's not much to keep players seated, but it tries regardless. I know at least two people will want to try the game after this video, so I'll keep the story spiel to a minimum. The story progresses by speaking to characters and completing adventures. Generally speaking, an area won't open up until you've spoken to the appropriate NPC, so you're made to speak with everyone, and that's why y'all should follow that LP. It's fantastic. While the quest starts small, with Greydrill solving her kingdom's problems by hand, it quickly spins into a continent-spanning quest against a demon lord who wreaks havoc throughout the land. It involves a lot of MacGuffin collecting, generally gems and crowns and things, and even a time travel segment to rescue a slain ally. It's very pulp fantasy, more concerned with the shiny sh the playfulness, and the doom laid three spoons thick. But it's otherwise a light-hearted and enjoyable little story, ultimately about self-actualization. I don't really care about the plot's finer points. In the medium of video games, telling a story about going out and getting better, told through these mechanics and systems, is doing its job. Princess Crown could leave the player with the base experience, but chooses, instead, to hand the player three sub-stories, Edward the Dragon Slayer, Corcus the Pirate, and Proserpina the Witch. That's great, but I'm a little disappointed we can't play as the cat. It's such a cherry on top, flaunting the work like, if this doesn't sell, at least it'll be a full product. And it's hard to admonish the game for that. Princess Crown does dragon places. Most of the latter half of the game is spent churning through enemies you've seen, places you've been, and all to contextualize additional boss fights in old places instead of simply forcing a fight without an extraneous dungeon. It's padded, handing the player even more of effectively the same experience is a bold choice. And Proserpina's quest is particularly annoying because she's easily the weakest of the characters. Yeah, nice hover attack, try hitting a combo, dumbass. But it's also really rewarding to control major story characters. How often does that happen in old games? And they're not clones. The fundamentals carry over between characters, but their movesets completely reflavor the experience. Edward's sword can reach much further than Greydreel's and breaks the balance against certain enemies vastly in the player's favor. All of their quests are significantly shorter than the main game, maybe a few hours per, and it's fun to blast through each with a sort of super grade reel. Porkus is just, like his hitboxes linger and he crushes so many enemy types with his literally just Charlotte Samurai Showdown jumping seed. Look at this! I see your game, Kamatani. Good taste! Immaculate taste! These sub-stories exist to flesh out lingering questions, not that I had many in my run for obvious reasons. At the very least, they explain away the gaps in the plot or contextualize how these people got out and involved with Great Real at all. It's a fair amount of respect given to something that never really called for it. The final book pits Greydreel against the dragon who manipulated various characters to his own ends. It's a neat little capstone at the end of the run, definitively allowing the player to close the book on Princess Crown. The game was long, sometimes dragged, and took a hell of a lot of adaptation and perseverance, but sitting at the top of the mountain feels satisfying in a way I can't explain in a simple phrase. Thank you, George. I think it's the sense of accomplishment, having played something that so, so few people have experienced over the years, certainly from my own country, or hemisphere for that matter, and a puny fraction have cleanly run through recently. How can someone find value in something they can't meaningfully understand? But this is the reason I value experiences that others never even realize exist. The world as we know it is charted. Space is beyond reach, maybe even irresponsible to think about given the state of the planet. And yet, in these microscopic digital adventures, a person can claim something almost akin to a feeling of genuine excavation. It's the beautiful thing about emulation and old games. Hundreds of thousands of fading worlds buried by mountains of novelties past still exist today, waiting for someone to dig them up.
Before getting into Odin Sphere proper, here's some mandatory Vanillaware history to fill the decade-long gap between releases. The, the founding, founding of Vanillaware. Vanillaware. Between Princess Crown and Odin Sphere, Kamatani did work for Square Enix on an MMO that would eventually be called Fantasy Earth Zero, which features recycled designs from the planned Princess Crown sequel. Unfortunately, Square took the game away from him, presumably due to a rough development cycle, so with two bankruptcies in his wake, although only one actually hinged on his work, alongside minimal sales on his one-shipped project, and being shunted from his second, Kamatani changed his team's name to Vanillaware, moved to Osaka, and with Atlas's help, began work on Odin Sphere, the true sequel to Princess Crown. In the previously referenced interview with Glixel, Kamatani mentions that every Vanillaware game, and particularly the action titles, are tempered by past criticism. All of the games I made are precious to me. They're like my daughters, but they each have their shortcomings that have been pointed out by consumers. I made Odin Sphere based on criticisms of Princess Crown. Odin Sphere also had a lot of problems, so I made Muramasa the Demon Blade with those criticisms in mind. The lineup in this video may seem strange, but there's validity to it, at least in the eyes of its creator. And for anyone who's only played Odin Sphere, but watched up until this part of the video, hey, how does it feel to know there's a whole prototype of the game you love? Odin Sphere is Princess Crown 2. It's got the big banner logo, it's got the book selection hub, and a little baby called Socrates! Maybe video games are a little bit okay. Odin Sphere features multiple playable characters whose paths must be unlocked by completing preceding character stories. The game puts emphasis on treasure chests, increasing maximum health by eating incredible food, multi-bite fruits, gigantic Dahunka Bunka Luz on dead women, so, so much is directly carried over from Princess Crown, it's kind of mind-bending. Oh my god! It's him, the mushroom from Princess Crown, and wait, the legend, the mushroom. Buddy knew he was cooking with gas, and Odin Sphere itself is a sort of turbocharged version of its progenitor. The actual gameplay framework is overhauled in service of creating a powerful gameplay loop that hooks players in and keeps them going long past where the average player would have switched off Princess Crown. So, the price of progress. One of the most common critiques I get is that my method, playing games back to back, has ramifications and creates burnout which some people use as leverage to disagree with a take I had. I took Rhetoric 101 a decade ago, so this isn't new to me. Your moves have been calculated and your swings parried. But what I like to remind people of is that some games I play are incredibly repetitive but don't drive me insane or burn me out. For reference, I played Odin Sphere last after every other game featured in this video. Some experiences are crafted so tightly that the slug, regardless of whether or not I feel it, doesn't detract from my experience. It helps that action RPGs are basically my favorite thing. And Odin Sphere is a perfect example. The game was originally developed for the PS2 and released in 2007, though many of its fans enjoyed the re-release, Odin Sphere Leiftrazir, via the PS3, PS4, or PS Vita in 2016. I'd argue that the Vita version is ideal because handheld play suits this type of game best, being able to switch off and on again in a second. Sitting down and running through a level or two would make the run breezy, but even playing on a slightly more committal home console didn't take me out of the Odin Sphere vortex. Yeah. Had me like SF4 Vega. Looping beautifully, the basic loop is repeated over five stories. In short, you watch a cutscene, enter a level, battle on through, completing challenges, eating food, leveling up, minding your RPG elements, killing sub-bosses, watching a cutscene, beating down a final boss, hitting the cutscene payoff, and repeating six times per. You'd think it'd get old, but no. No, not really, no. And let's get into why by talking about Dopamine. The game is opulent. I understand that the original was lower resolution and had tech issues the modern version doesn't, but Vanillaware's Kamatani style blazes off the screen. Right in my eyes! We don't get enough games like this. I think back to the PS1 where this kind of thing was more common. Legend of Mana, Saga Frontier 2, hand-drawn artistry has always had a withering role in the industry. In a tech-fetishizing culture, beauty is always going to be less important than raw fidelity, you know, pushing technical limitations. And that's not some black mark against the industry, even if it absolutely is, just look at Shadow of the Colossus and its hardware-punishing use of 3D rendering and mechanics, creating a convincing kinetic experience in a three-dimensional world. I love that stuff too. I'm just saying that I've never met someone with 
actual artistic sensibilities that has no appreciation for what hand-drawn art does for presentation. And I never will. Everything from the treasure you find to the food you eat is presented with the care of a chef plating and topping off their signature dish. It's a game of absolute visual artisanship. It... I gotta cook. I'm not much of a chef, but I do like making things and putting the final touches on a dish you love and love to impress with is another realm of satisfaction. It's love. Plating something just right so it looks restaurant worthy brings me genuine happiness. And I think it's the choosing to be indulgent, a tertiary goal alongside serving the nose and mouth, both secondary to the primary goal the food is mouthwatering. I got up and cooked twice in one day because of this game. Gnocchi and omurice to be specific. And it owned. Kamatani got me excited to get in the kitchen and do chores. What a beautiful game. Mechanically speaking, you grow food with phosons, these glowing orbs that function something like experience. Harvest the fruit, or sheep I guess. Oh my god! And eat grown food for health and experience points. Very Kamatani system here, giving players a consumable that immediately benefits them in multiple ways. And as your playthrough progresses, you unlock plenty of recipes, which leads you to gather ingredients any way you can. Like in shops, harvesting, or in chests. This might be a good spot to find some ingredients. To cook for extreme experience payoffs. Like it gets tedious by about playthrough three, having to level up this way, you know, ding the bell, talk to the rabbit chef Maury, droopy eared sack, look for the thing you want, but whoops, you need an egg, so you close the menu and walk over to the guy and buy the egg, go back, talk to Maury, and finally order, watch and skip the cutscene because you're tired, and this happens multiple times per dungeon by the end game, but the payoffs are tangible, so you keep on shoveling that sh into your mouth. Look at the rabbit or a puka village kitchen. Look at the Puka Village Bakery. I am literally gonna die. My heart can't take this kind of swelling. I will never be this cozy. And with treasure dropped after every battle, just like Princess Crown, Kamatani's vision snaps into focus. He wants people to be happy playing his games. And he does this by, you know, incorporating fighting game mechanics and elements into his side-scrollers, letting you juggle enemies even after they're dead to rack up insane combo strings. Oh my god. God. But more importantly, by appealing to human desire, food, wealth, beauty, vanillaware games are decadence made manifest. Kamatani refers to himself as someone with arrested development. He's been the subject of various attacks across games media for his work, specifically for Dragon's Crown, but I think people miss the bigger picture. Art across all human history has swung like a pendulum. In one period, one set of aesthetic principles are held above others until someone thinks, I want to say something else, and does, lighting a flame and kickstarting another movement, ad infinitum. One of the most easily illustrated examples involves the disparity between the romantics and the decadence and aesthetics. For a non-insignificant portion of European history, art was dominated by works that sought a return to and veneration of nature. Romantic poets like Wordsworth and Blake spun myth out of the mundane, of simple observances that captured the sublimity of nature's raw, unfettered self. And that artistic movement largely came to be because of the enclosure movement, where legislative bodies parceled off the countryside for private interests, factories, companies, anyone other than the peasants. Art reacted to policy and the death of something profoundly beautiful. Nostalgia underpins romanticism as a movement, but it's one that I love because it takes simple joy in the beauty that is. The rolling green hill, the sunlight dappled leaves, the smell of the rain. Decadence and aestheticism, two separate but similar movements, rose largely in reaction to the dominance of this naturalistic and somber method of beauty making. 
though some posit its excesses are actually in reaction to the very restrictive Victorian-era England social mores. Both of these things running rampant across paintings, novels, plays, culture writ large, romanticism worshipped nature, even using nature as a metaphor for God, and arguably stagnated over decades, suddenly in the minds of a few notable individuals, beginning with the original French decadence and German aesthetics, and eventually reaching England with certain high-minded artists, author and playwright Oscar Wilde, etc., beauty became intentional, fabricated, serving nothing but itself. Fine art was to be produced for its own sake, rather than to teach or inform its audience. As someone with more romantic sensibilities myself, I find the words of the decadence kind of concerning, though I appreciate the sentiment. The decadence, aestheticism, and similar movements rose, like romanticism before it, in reaction to a perceived problem. Worth noting is the screed against decadence, penned by social critic and Zionist Max Nordeau, called Degeneration, which parallels modern-day language used by reactionaries to discredit modern art and the state of modern society writ large. In the tendencies of contemporary art and poetry, in the life and conduct of men who write mystic, symbolic, and decadent works, and the attitude taken by their admirers and the tastes and aesthetic instincts of fashionable society, the confluence of two well-defined conditions of disease with which he, the physician, is quite familiar vis-a-vis -vis degeneration and hysteria, of which the minor stages are designated as neurasthenia. Well, that's a fine thing to say. You make art I don't like, so you're mentally ill. I wonder where I've heard that! You only have to look at history to see how the pendulum swings, to see that all expression has a place at the table. No need to get worked up about a little art for art's sake, a little cleave. While Kamatani's work exudes a love of nature, it tends to be a cropped, framed version of nature that's aesthetically pleasing first, not quite raw and wild and pure. His other aesthetic sensibilities cast him as a sort of modern decadent, which feels like a natural path to walk given some of his artistic inspirations. Enemies tend to fade into the background due to the game's quick combat and focus on boss monsters, and you see the same things a lot, a lot, a lot of times over a full playthrough. Places, foods, and treasures as well. It's enough to turn the thing rich and repulsive for some, but I was never overly bothered by it. When you play a lot of games, you gain a greater appreciation for the medium, the challenges and limitations, and the care that goes into crafting something so vibrant. At the core of that vibrancy, though, is the play, and it hits in a way I never expected. Odin's Sphere has five playable characters who unlock one after another. The Valkyrie, the Puka Prince, the Fairy Queen, the Knight, and the Princess. And they all kick ass in completely different ways. A quick aside, I understand the original game and its characters' playstyles differ slightly from the versions found in Leithrazir, but Kamatani himself had issues with his original game, and instead of outright removing things for the remaster, the new staffers, presumably fans of the original, wanted to preserve the cruft while addressing criticism. Criticisms. So my comments only extend to Leith Razir, but it's ultimately considered the definitive version. The Valkyrie, Gwendolyn, focuses on powerful aerial combos with stylish juggles and devastating mobile spear strikes. The Puka Prince, Cornelius, conversely dominates the ground with crushing special abilities. The Fairy Queen turns the game into something like Metal Slug. She's kind of frail, but her ranged offense actually warps the genre, from melee-focused action RPG to side-scrolling shooter. The Knight, Oswald, uses attacks to charge up a bar and unleashes a demon form that lets him tear through enemies and rip across the screen. The princess, Velvet, has a sort of mid-range weapon that lets her control space more thoroughly than other melee fighters and gives her wide-ranging combos leading to massive special attack crescendos. Their stories matter, and they've got individuality, personalities that bleed into their play, but above that, the combat just hits. Let's lay the groundwork. Like with most of Odin's Sphere, imagine combat as Princess Crown's Super Turbo Edition. Duels only happen with boss enemies, meaning most encounters are functionally beat-em-up style, set on a flat plane. Almost every character is highly mobile, with strong jumps and dashes, allowing you to reposition in a flash in various ways, and control the battlefield with combos. You can hit up, plunge down, and dash attack with intuitive directional inputs as well. You can guard and otherwise evade, but the speed and potential lethality of combat demand much more frantic, active play than anything in Princess Crown. 
Combat is best handled by stunning enemies with repeated attacks, or attacking weak points with particular moves, rendering them juggleable. You're intended to clear rooms as fast as possible, and preferably with a huge combo counter and no damage. You're ranked after every encounter, which translates to scaling rewards, but it's not particularly hard to land Bs and As throughout. Attacks are swift, but hit with just enough juice cause just enough screen freeze and shake to feel weighty and impactful in a way I never expected from 2D combat. You can't just watch gameplay to get the experience of this game and its sequel, Muramasa. They have to be played to be felt. And that sounds obvious, but what I really mean is, if I watched a video on this game instead of playing it, I wouldn't have given it a second thought. Odin Sphere is a real compelling case for the value of 2D action combat. It's effectively 2D DMC at times, depending on the character. And in a grandiose fantasy setting, moving away from the quaint rural fantasy of Princess Crown by the first frame of the game, exaggerated, surreal combo strings and earth-shaking super moves only elevate the allure of the setting. Decadence extends from visuals to play. So how do characters mechanically convey their narrative value? Gwendolyn is a Valkyrie, meaning she has wings and can hover in combat, and while she's also one of Odin's daughters, isn't treated like a princess. She's made to try to push for recognition by her imposing father. So her dash attack is a vicious thrust forward. Her attack out of her gliding animation sends her hurtling into the earth, and her combos revolve around landing these impressive spear flourishes chained into her brutal aerial thrust. Her combat is a dizzying spectacle that can be hard to keep up with because Gwendolyn, like as a person, is ramming forward into the future with everything she has for her right to exist, to establish her personhood. It's enhanced by every male she interacts with, aside from Oswald, treating her like an object to be won. If you leave her, she will be executed. Yo, they got Twitter in this bill! Cornelius is a man cursed to be a puka, a squat humanoid rabbit, but his noble bearing and love for a certain princess, despite incompatible form, means he strikes out into the world with his oversized broadsword and overcompensates for his size with the might of his will, felling enemies with the sheer momentum his blade demands, the sheer weight of it, his love and his responsibility to his kingdom, driving him ever forward through the hordes. Mercedes takes on the mantle of Queen quickly and unexpectedly, if fairy Greydriel. The heft of her mother's own weapon physically weighing on her in combat. Her crossbow makes the screen shake, either because it's just that powerful, or because it's such a burden, physically and emotionally, to carry. While she's a frail fighter and needs to attack from afar to survive, it ludonarratively aligns with her general inexperience, and with her anxiety to live up to her mother's name and save her people in a hostile world. Also, for all my talk of repetition, you know, because she can fly, she actually gets vertical stage segments and a flying shooter segment, which which man, it's the details, it's the details. Oswald is effectively the puppet of Melvin, <laughs> who raised him to be the perfect soldier and bestowed to him the Belder Reaver, the strongest of the cipher weapons, the uh, crystalline weapons wielded by each of the protagonists. Oswald's life is manipulated by his apparent savior, parceled off to the Queen of Death, whose power fuels the Belder Reaver and tempts fate merely by using it, ensuring that one day he will die and will serve the Queen of Death in the afterlife. His play pattern changes significantly across the original version of the game and Leif Thrazir, but regardless, Oswald must tap into dark powers to meaningfully combat enemies and eventually let himself be overtaken by the berserker form, leaving his future uncertain. If he's so constantly tempted by darkness, maybe he'll eventually succumb, fail to live up to his vows. Velvet is one of the last remaining members of the Valentinian royalty. Her people made a strategic non-factor via the Puka curse. Her brother Ingwe is also relevant to the plot and was almost made playable, but he had no cipher so was scrapped. Apparently. Velvet's outfit seems to be tapping into traditional Roma garb, and her play is dance-like. Even though Kamatani directly undercuts my interpretation here and says the design is Middle Eastern and incidental, so <laughs> stop reading into games, K-Bad. Her visuals at least convey the nomadic nature of her and her people. She's also the weakest character, starting out very, very pathetic and made to ascend extremely quickly, possibly to convey the weight of the burden she carries for her people's sake, much like Mercedes, but unlike Mercedes with her advisors and followers, Velvet has only her brother and some scattered citizens. I'm taking time to 
to point these out because the story of Odin Sphere is ambitious and interesting on its own, but this is a game primarily focused on selling a tight play experience. The real video game story at work lies in the characters and how they control how thoroughly their play matches their individual lives and stories. It's a smart game and it's designed with intention. Pay attention. Of course, this is an action RPG and combat isn't all skill. One of the best things Kamatani carried forward from Princess Crown was the repeated consumable item use. There's a whole alchemy subsystem allowing the player to concoct potions, antidotes, volcano files, you know, all kinds of deranged stuff. It consolidates the magic system of the previous game, scrolls, gems, and staves, into potions, which are mixed with different kinds of mandragora, these sentient vegetables you beat the tar out of and grind them up and mix them. Kind of deranged, but sure. Awesome, now I've got fire in a bottle, literally. Yeah, it pulls you out of the action, but it's not a pure action game. I'm not here for Ninja Gaiden. And typically you pull them out to save your hide. It mostly only feels good. Potions can completely warp combat. A gigantic whirlwind will win you almost any battle and keep your rank high while doing it. I saved them for sub bosses and challenge enemies more often than actual stage bosses, however, because Odin Sphere has some interesting progression quirks. The gist is, you could run to the end of any level fairly quickly, only doing what you must, the occasional key collection, etc., ignoring every extraneous room and treasure chest on the way. But the systems are so laced with dopamine, feel so rewarding to engage with, you'll find yourself gunning for the challenge rooms, potions in hand, ready to walk in swinging. It's a game that feels good to get better at, and that feels enticing to earnestly engage with, and that's not something that every game manages. Like, I'm the last guy to tackle side content, and there I was, side contenting for bigger number. Damn you, Kamatani. Damn you to hell! I don't want to give Kamatani too much credit for this bit about decadence I'm on. There's a part of the work that's also tapped in very keenly to the player's dopamine receptors, which I'm at least a little leery of in game design because I think it can eventually lead to a place like Diablo 3 where legendary loot bursts out of kind of average monsters all things considered for the sake of keeping the player dazzled by the jingling keys, which I think devalues that setting narratively a bit. In the Diablo series, you battle through a dark world where mankind's inevitable doom lurks in every shadow. At least until your witch doctor, I guess, ascends to demigod status and ultra murders every demon in a two mile radius with magical fire bats and wheels on his feet. But there's no real conflict of interest here narratively with the dopamine received and the setting. It's a big, colorful fantasy world that leans dark at times, but also makes room for mouth-watering feasts served via a teleporting rabbit man. And your characters are armed with the strongest weapons on the planet in a conflict set amidst magical warring nations and dragons. The worst it does is play to your squishy gamer brain, and really, unlike some other games, Odin Sphere has an upper limit you'll be able to reach before it's all a little too rich. That's a pile of words to say, I don't think it's openly and toxically manipulative uh, the way other games that tap hard into dopamine can be. It doesn't have microtransactions, it doesn't have seasons, it's a one and done. I've often seen people online and in person as well talk about disliking quote, generic fantasy and also anime aesthetic in any context. Anime aesthetic, I guess, implying popular modern Japanese art, cause uh, they call King of the Hill anime there. What's interesting is seeing a Japanese creator inspired by Western material presenting a fused aesthetic. Anime isn't a far-fetched descriptor, and not just because the characters could fit in manga panels. Some of the attacks characters perform, even their designs, mimic famous anime characters. And yet, these multitudinous references are cast in a firmly European context. Knights, medieval peasants, cobblestone, even the dinner menu. <laughs> and yet, these decidedly European elements are a total pastiche. Gnocchi and chip salad, Norse myth flavored berserkers, Valkyries, gnomes, dwarves, fairies, and male fairies who look like elves but aren't elves, magical mushroom forests with shrinking spores, goblins, mandragora, manticores, it's almost western fantasy fanfiction, encapsulating all things interesting to the author but without any inherent consistency. In a sense, that's the ideal way to handle such an obscenely decadent fantasy vision, putting everything you like into the pot and mixing it together, letting the craft and presentation sell the work, rather than the internal or historical value implied by these elements. In another sense, it's 
kind of creatively juvenile, arguably deliberately not engaging with the historical relevance of these elements. This isn't the video to dig away at every character's individual story. They follow their arcs in interesting enough ways, but the focus is largely on the play until the end game. Once the player completes every adventure, hopefully leaving their character well equipped for combat, a final set of bosses becomes available and you can tackle them in whatever order you like, one character per boss. Only Odin Sphere has three endings, and you need to select the correct character for each of the bosses according to a prophecy scattered throughout the game to reach the true ending. It's a cute little thing to do at the end, albeit fairly exhausting as these enemies have piles of health. And if you're poorly kitted out, lacking in curatives and things, you're in for some frustration at the moment when things should be triumphant. Princess Crown avoids this annoyance by pitting the player against an obnoxious enemy they implicitly knew how to fight, having played the same character in a fairly limited system for hours. Odin Sphere has the player mash through five insane boss fights at the end of five very samey campaigns, often not knowing the appropriate order. It's a bit of an ask. But if Metroid Prime can tell you to walk through the entire world, I guess this game can too. Now, I liked Odin Sphere a lot for obvious reasons. It's a direct continuation of the <laughs> Princess Crown design lineage and specifically was made as a means of showing off what an advanced version of a Princess Crown story could look like. One more intricate, one more interconnected and aspirational, and it succeeds. But Odin Sphere is best looked at in a lineage from Princess Crown to itself and then to its final form, Muramasa. Refine the self. Pass like a silent breeze. This is the path. Kamatani, are you watching? Muramasa the Demon Blade, also known as Obora Muramasa in Japan, only makes one real compromise for Western players, and that's its title. Like with Neo, which I recently covered, Muramasa has no dub. It's delivered in Japanese the length of the run, and with few to no noticeable loanwords, which are so common in modern Japanese. This works on multiple levels for the game. Obviously, dubs cost money, and Vanillaware doesn't, certainly didn't, have a whole lot to spare. It also stylistically reinforces its own engrossing Japanese aesthetic. Think back to Princess Crown, a Sega Saturn Japanese language game. English litters the screen. Its combat is almost foreigner-friendly. Setting aside that it's mostly only for combat and not for every bit of text found in combat. While Muramasa is a fundamentally Japanese piece of art, it's worthwhile not to treat its influences as a monolith. Muramasa draws on a mixture of Shintoist and Buddhist cosmology slash mythology, which makes sense. Modern day Japanese spirituality makes room for Shinto, Buddhism, and Christianity. Like with Odin Sphere before it, Muramasa draws from theater to deliver its story, something Kamatani believed would work for Vanillaware's 2D aesthetic and limited potential expression, you know, lacking 3D. Hand-drawn art is beautiful, but makes some things challenging. Being deeply Japanese, however, Muramasa draws from kabuki theater, multiple historical works, actually, which are complemented by Kamatani's exaggerated style. The expressive, theatrical writing is better preserved in the Vita version, the Wii's localization is pretty flat by comparison, and that language might have elevated some of the story scenes which forced the player to speak to all characters on screen, threatening to kill one another but unable to do so until the set changes. Muramasa stands out in the Vanillaware lineup as one of the only games aesthetically rooted in Kamatani's own heritage. Of all the games they released, only one mechanically builds off every lesson learned from the previous titles when viewed in order, and stands as the premier example of Vanillaware's 2D action framework. And if you can't take it from me, here's Kentaro Onishi, Vanillaware's lead programmer. For the world setting and game system, I would say Dragon's Crown, but after some of the negative comments regarding the PS2 version of Odin Sphere, Mr. Kamitani and I racked our brains, and Muramasa was the title where we totally changed our thinking regarding programming structures and games. There was so much trial and error with Muramasa, I have a special attachment to it. I don't want to get cutesy here, because you know. It's based in Japan, you wield katanas, and then say something like, Muramasa is like a 10,000 times folded steel wakizashi or some annoying sh I would never say that. 
It's just that I feel it very strongly. Muramasa was initially released for the Nintendo Wii in 2009, a weird path to take given Vanillaware's historical exclusivity to Sony consoles. And the reason was simply that the Wii had similar hardware specs as the PS2, meaning it would be easy to carry over assets from Odin Sphere. And while 360 and PS3 proposals were drafted, they never materialized due to budget constraints. The seventh generation of consoles was miserable to develop for, at least for what was effectively a poverty studio. In funds, not in heart, already on thin ice financially. Muramasa owes its inception to Princess Crown as well. Both Odin Sphere and Muramasa were created specifically to further the legacy of that title. And where Odin Sphere had to be stripped of various elements, including a world to traverse, at all, Muramasa was a chance to further the Princess Crown agenda. With a unified vision for combat and modernized versions of the elements that made Princess Crown, Muramasa is a design triumph for the studio that unfortunately didn't sell as well as Odin Sphere, and in the search for perfection, maybe trims a little more off than necessary. While the Wii version is competent and allows for GameCube controllers so you don't have to use the stupid f***ing Wiimo, the PS Vita version is easily the superior experience, with the same handheld ups sides mentioned in the previous section, and all new DLC characters with entirely unique gameplay shakeups. Development on Muramasa began halfway through development on Odin Sphere. Kamatani called it Princess Crown 3. I love the, uh, the commitment to the bit. That game was good, and unfairly ignored in its time, and he just kept going. Muramasa's design was intended to expand on the world concept established in Princess Crown and relegated to stage selection in Odin Sphere. So it did, and easily better than Crown, which required a kind of plotting traversal through a relatively large map. And fast travel only opened up later in the game. You were stopped randomly, sometimes twice, sometimes not at all, on any given road. Muramasa isn't a nightmare to wander through and gives the player rewards for bothering. The combat is also enhanced, passes in a flash. It's not better than Odin Sphere's multiple kinds of combat. That would probably be a stretch, but it could easily slot in as one of the greatest in Odin Sphere if it were retroactively inserted. What it does well, in reality, is expand the scope and freedom of Greydreal's original adventure. Princess Crown was a dual simulator of sorts, and while Muramasa features many enemies on the screen, it's never as much of a cluster f yeah. as Odin Sphere, which careened all throughout the circular battlegrounds. Muramasa's battles were cleanly contained, offering unique challenges with each kind of enemy. You've gotta guard break some, go aerial on others, stay extremely vigilant and mobile against ninjas. There's even pseudo-combat challenges like the Yukiona whose attacks must be reflected with timed swings, and flying swarms that'll leave you unrewarded if you can't take them all down in time. It's pushing design to the limit with a flashy and engaging framework that maybe doesn't necessarily trump Odin Sphere, but easily earns praise for its fluidity. It's extremely easy to reach conclusions about a work of art based on a premise or two. For example, I want to write a saccharine lull yarn about how Muramasa was the third princess crown, refocused and worked with material that should be closer to second nature for the team than Western fantasy fair. How it cropped the play to a bare minimum to suit the mechanics of the game and sell the narrative. How they pushed to craft the sharpest game in the series, just like a 10,000 times folded steel blade. And while that's all kind of true, or incidentally happened to become true, the actual dev history resists that kind of editorializing. The truth is, the game had 16 staffers, all of whom were overworked. They worked with the Wii because it was cheaper and easier than the other 7th gen consoles, and even still, issues with Vanillaware's painterly aesthetic and play forced the team to troubleshoot until the very end of development. The original version had more characters than the mere two on offer, something I wanted to charitably read as trimming the fat, but in reality, Kamatani wanted another full-blooded Japanese princess crown game. Muramasa is a compromise on a vision, like so much of game development is, and it's only as sleek as it is by happenstance. For what it's worth, it may be the easiest way to sell someone on Vanillaware, if you can get them sat down and playing. Now I mean it, the game's really sharp. Interviews suggest that, being on the Wii, it could've come out a little more experimental. Actually, we tested various things, but the actions are so fast that you couldn't follow the speed of the action. Picks up Wiimote like chopsticks. This guy is serious. In the end, we removed all those features. Actually, I really insisted on including that feature in the eating scenes, but the programmers said no. The programmers cut that aspect because they thought people wouldn't like it, because it's annoying. These are too big for chopsticks. Whoa, these are too big for chopsticks. <laughs>
<laughs> Ultimately, we can only talk about what's on offer, so let's unsheath this thing. Muramasa the Demon Blade is Princess Crown if its combat were made for a much larger audience that wanted to play Ninja Gaiden, but Mom sold the Xbox while they were at college. It features two characters, Momohime and Kisuke, with two distinct stories, different bosses, but basically the same experience overall, like with Odin Sphere. It presents a unified vision of combat, one system, one set of mechanics, complex and challenging enough to carry the play for two full adventures, and unlike Odin Sphere, offers a full world to wander through. I don't want to say explore, you really don't do any exploring in this game unless you're hunting for bonuses, challenges, and specific items, but a world nonetheless. It's one of the sadder cuts from Odin Sphere, reducing that entire magical world into actual spheres or rings is almost a mark against the game. Now, I think it works in Odin Sphere's favor, actually. They expanded the world with things like the Puka Village and with a consistent gameplay loop. You know, there's no need to overcomplicate by obfuscating progress with a set of roads. Muramasa's world is a return to form, something that Princess Crown established, but it's not handled exactly the same. Firstly, players are vastly more mobile, and you're led up and down the screen with little orbs which help increase your power eventually. Either way, you engage with the physical space, platforming, item uncovering, etc., than you ever could in Princess Crown. And while the framework is basically Odin Spheres when you're in any given screen, there's a different vibe. Odin Spheres' world, presented in circles, acts something like a portrait of the world, an abstraction of the physical space, whereas Muramasa's plainly presented world is itself. Unfortunately, because this is a vanillaware game and this many hand-drawn assets is probably hell to produce, you end up seeing a world on repeat as you traverse from screen to screen, from campaign to campaign. There's an argument for the repetition, you know. Aside from the basic dev time limitations, we all know cola sucks for health, but I'd still take it with dinner every night till my teeth fall out. Mercifully, the world is quite large and you don't really make total use of it, so either campaign is allowed to feature unique areas and be deliberate about repetition. Odin Sphere also struggled with this, but kind of made up for it by having some areas you couldn't help but love. The forest. I'm partial to the battlefield myself, but I hated running the red-tinged fire level in the land of death. I don't have that kind of relationship with the map in Muramasa. It fades into the background and enhances the flavors of each level meaningfully, but never turns into a, ah, oh, fuck, this again deal. Now, the world is dotted with save points and villages and gated by magical walls you need the appropriate sword to cut through. So if anyone in Ego wants to trade goods in Issei, I guess they can suck sh <laughs> Villages, merchants, restaurants, these are all important to the world and the game. But you're not really made to simmer in the setting at all. The best you can do is visit some NPCs, stock up, get a meal, and peace. It's kind of a shame. Bathing sequences, both planned and ultimately cut from Odin Sphere, were reworked into Muramasa, and it might have been worthwhile to put them in town specifically to really sell that rural Japanese charm, but instead they're found by following monkeys scattered around levels. It's not a bad system, lets you talk to other characters on occasion, usually for the sake of affirming the timelines of the two protagonists who cross paths during their own quests in these places, but that's about it. Sells the allure of the countryside well enough, I just wish I spent more time interacting in quaint little villages. I need my <laughs> whims. I need my whims now. While we're on aesthetics, Muramasa takes place in a mythological version of historical Japan, but maintains a level of groundedness. It's still stunning and painterly with an eye to the picturesque. The mundane world is presented first, and you visit increasingly mythical spaces over the course of any given adventure. Hell, heaven, but it's mostly grounded otherwise. The palettes are more muted than Odin spheres, incorporating heavy shadows, offset by powerful contrasting colors, lighting and weather effects. Effects. Levels are interactive paintings. And because the world is attempting a greater level of verisimilitude, battles aren't sprung by walking through doors, and rather via ambush on any given path. I know, it's minutia, but it's the details of vanillaware games that really sell their unique flavor. Signature twists of the brush, you know? Muramasa's combat is ultimately what sold me on vanillaware. I played Dragon's Crown years ago and thought it was sharp but also highly punishing. It was designed for multiplayer in a way the other titles obviously weren't. Genuinely, it was created with multiplayer in mind. It's got couch co-op and online play. But having stopped at Dragon's Crown back then, I might never have seen what Vanillaware's design could be. These other games have historically sold less. 
niche little experiences for a niche little crowd, but they're frankly more worthwhile than their numbers imply. Combat is something like an advanced version of Odin Spheres, with specific mechanical challenges that warp the experience into its own unique system. Difficulty actually impacts this, so... Ugh. Muramasa features two difficulty modes, Muso Mode and Shura Mode, Normal and Hard respectively or easy and normal if you're an asshole. Shura mode requires you to play raw, hold the attack button to guard incoming blows, and with tweaked numbers, you can die in a few hits if you're not careful. I found it enjoyable enough and perfectly aligned with the narrative of the game. Both characters wield the secret Ogoro-style arts, the ultimate sword techniques, to outskill any enemy. Being made to play at that higher level is functionally more accurate to the game's events. The easier difficulty basically includes auto blocks, so you're always effectively holding A to block, unless you're in the middle of an attack. That said, there's a narrative argument for the normal mode, that embodying these characters makes you so inherently powerful, taking control of a master of the ultimate sword style, or in Momohime's case, a princess actually embodied by a master of the sword style, that you no longer need to worry about something petty like holding to block. You can change any time and tweak your experience accordingly. Also, uh, difficulty people should be shrunken, contained in jars, and studied. You can combo by mashing the attack button, which works similarly grounded or airborne, but the real trick is motion attacks. Holding A to guard also opens up the option to input for an attack forward to dash attack, up to ascend, and down while airborne to plunge. You can also do a couple grounded moves, mostly to break shields by holding and releasing, etc., but I want to focus on the input moves most. This is how Muramasa sells the ninja vibe. Your basic moveset is hypermobile. You kill in a blink and tear through swarms like paper. Your enemies have only a fraction of your mobility often, so you dominate the screen. Your swords have affixed special abilities that give you iframes and swing things in your favor. And you've got regular access to an EI strike, a full screen attack. The only trade-off is, at least on hard mode, you die in a few hits, and it's real easy to screw up unless you're precise, giving the player instant access to mobility and the tap, damage, and oh sh** button on a timer is so, so smart. I love Odin Sphere and what its combat does, even if it's not 100% consistent among characters, but this particular vision is so engaging because of how empowering it is immediately. Even if it's not functionally different from Odin Sphere, boss enemies still take a long time to kill, and special moves act kind of like the potions in that game, giving the player everything consistently is massively reassuring. You're never stuck playing the bad character, or the one you don't like, or the one that eventually gets good, but it takes 10 hours to get there because the play was good enough for both. You only find two kinds of weapons, katana and odachis, which swing quickly and slowly respectively. Sorry, did I say odachi? I meant long blade. I meant long schlong and blade. But you usually have at least one of either kind among the three swords you can equip at any time. Muramasa is an action game, but it's still caught up in the RPG framework. It's vanillaware. RPG elements no matter, and to the combat as well. Let's talk about them. Equipment is sparse across all of these games, and I appreciate that. Equipment is annoying, and having too much of it reduces a game to numbers and menus more than functional skill, arguably, if used as a means of gating progression. In Muramasa, equipment is effectively limited to a single slot, one bonus equip that alters something tiny about your character, not unlike Odin Sphere's three slots, but again, reduced. The main equip is swords. Your character can equip up to three, and you'll want them anyway, so you might as well. You craft them with spirit and unhelpfully soul earned on the field and through battle, and they become available for crafting by reaching certain thresholds in-game. To make it quick, you're basically always able to build what you need for the next level, even if you just run a clean path between levels and ignore exploration challenges. It doesn't get in the way over much and lets you play Muramasa more like a traditional 2D action game, something like Beautiful Joe, than you might expect from Vanillaware. You're also able to cook by yourself this time, or purchase meals from restaurants. Cooking has perks. Being able to load up on yams is sweet. Just open the menu mid-battle and down one in a pinch. Wait, can you really do that? Can you just cover a potato with leaves and light them on fire to cook it? I'm gonna try that. If you engage with the systems, you'll have an easier time, but they're never mandatory. So eating cooked food yields spirit, one of the components used in blade forging. While it's not pumping your HP, it's keeping you powerful. Food's so important, even this guy's getting in on it. 
Wait, no. No! You don't acquire as many ingredients in the wild, you don't grow trees to harvest fruits, you don't generally buy a lot of cooking ingredients or pour over menus, at least in the same quantity, from vendors. You're basically always combat viable by minimally engaging and can power up significantly by taking your time. I really appreciate the balance they struck this time. It means play never has to be bogged down. But if you allow the countryside to wash over you, lose yourself in the woods and mountain paths, you can become a full better person. If I sit on this point too long, I'm gonna call Kamatani a neo-romantic, and that just isn't true. <laughs> sword quality does impact play, though. You can only guard with swords, and roll but ignore that, and swords degrade in quality as they shunt enemy blows. Some bosses decimate sword quality with every blocked swing, and eventually... Broken swords are usable, but obviously not as strong, but they magically recover when cheap. This turns play, at least when you're learning the game, into a frequent sword break, sword draw affair, meaning you're always unsheathing your blade, tearing through dudes with that badass full screen strike, and charging another as your last broken blade recovers. It keeps things fun and engaging in a way that even transcends the base mechanics, the high mobility, like the devs are trip feeding you slot machine tokens or something. George, you are like two for two with the weirdo yeah. shit, bro. Look at this boss enemy. Look at this other boss enemy. Here's another boss enemy. Let's talk about Kamatani's aesthetics for a second. It's true that not all assets in all Vanillaware games are handled by George Kamatani, but when he draws, you know. You know, his style is a lot of things, but its main function is representing things in highly characteristic, exaggerated ways. This would eventually cause problems for Dragon's Crown, but it's worth noting that the man was always drawing bizarre, mixed aesthetic work. His depiction of Albozu may be fairly typical, though still grotesque and imposing, spun in his unique presentation, especially contrasted with everything else in-game. Some of his boss designs are fairly typical, just enhanced, but his depiction of the thunder and wind gods, Raijin and Fujin, plays with the founding concept. He chooses interesting over accurate, and that's the charm. We see it throughout his work, all the way back to Princess Crown. Lanky and thin pirates, short and round pirates, big penis pirates, strange and regular men and women. And for Odin Sphere, with all its decadent charm, we see even more thorough exaggerations to match the madcap fantasticism of the setting. Odin is enormous. The face soldiers are lithe and even curved. Scoliosis people, bro. It's a game lined with funhouse mirrors. Kamatani has often been criticized for his depiction of bodies, and in some instances, it's understandable. But look at Tekken. Look at that roster and tell me a character like Raijin could ever make the cut. Many artists are fine depicting men as everything from monster to slightly femme to hyper-masculine. Men get to be anything. Women are often stuck as one to three body types, but if you take even a cursory glance at what's in Muramasa, you see wise and crones, this absolutely shredded deity, doll-like women, warriors. I'm not gonna pretend like all of Kamatani's designs work for me. And to be fair, not everyone gets the same treatment. Cue my old Dragon's Crown video. Fighter's gonna need to lose any kind of chest armor and probably have a fat bulge right there. But I think his intentional distortions of the human body deserve some admiration. Now, the story of Muramasa is more contained. Without five distinct characters spinning an entire mythology, we're left with only two major plot threads. I can't give the guy too much credit for the writing. Most of it is lifted directly from works of historical significance, like finding out that Hideo Kojima pulls a lot of stuff from movies, and it apparently caused some anxiety for the guy. Maybe the weight of having to deal with things he should know more about affected him. I like that admission. It kind of implies that he looked at Western fantasy as an aesthetic playground, and that may be why the games are so whimsical, just shoving what you like into the pot. The plots are pretty simple. Princess Momohime's soul is shunted out of her body by the invading Jinkuro, an Oboro sword-style master who goes on a quest for revenge. You grow to sympathize with Jinkuro over the course of the play. Even Momohime forgives him despite his legitimately evil behavior before and during the plot, and he eventually develops a kind of bond that softens his heart and heart, and he does the heroic thing at a pivotal moment to protect the girl. It's not a bad story. It keeps the game going and injects just, just enough pathos to 
feel like it was worth the effort, even if play is the main draw. Kisuke's story involves being hunted for crimes he can't remember due to a bout with amnesia. Finding and ultimately protecting a warrior princess Torahime out of love, initially forgotten, and ending the corrupt shogunate. I've seen internet commenters go back and forth on which is better, and really, it doesn't matter. They both draw primarily from classic works and don't represent incredibly original material except to someone not in the know, and the gameplay is the main reason to play, again. But I do appreciate the incidental chance at a focused vision for a vanillaware action game. Running four characters in Princess Crown eventually became exhausting, specifically with the Witch, and many players burn out during their Odin Sphere play somewhere around the Fairy Queen segment because it so radically alters play and moves away from the in-your-face kinetic combo system. Muramasa maintains one style, Oboro style, and presents it through two characters. Your first character is a dry run for the second, by which time you'll understand the game a whole lot better, and might even be tempted to go for the next difficulty instead of washing your hands clean and moving on. It's not as grandiose or sweeping as the tale told in Odin Sphere, but we can appreciate a ray of sun on a dew-glazed flower instead of the gleaming, braying horns, at least sometimes. You awake in the Kabash show with dagger in hand. Now is your chance. You can stop Kabash from ever having a bad video game opinion again. What will you do? Dragon's Crown. Because I've covered this game previously, I'll give you the shortest version of that video's premise. Yeah, it got dragged a lot for its depiction of women and specifically in the West, but isn't that missing the wood for the trees a bit? So yeah, basically Shakespeare. Amazing work. Just incredible! Dragon's Crown is a side-scrolling beat-em-up released in 2013 for the PS3 and PS Vita, and again in 2018 for the PS4 as Dragon's Crown Pro, which came with all the modern trappings from 4K compatibility to crossplay. It departs drastically from everything the previous game set out to accomplish. It is definitely not a Princess Crown follow-up, bearing resemblance only in aesthetic dressing, mild plot similarities, kind of 2D gameplay with depth the mechanics, and the typical Kamatani tropes from food to wealth to oh, Years back in the era of Princess Crown, Kamatani mentioned that he wanted to follow up that first game with a concept that would come to be called Dragon's Crown, whose assets were recycled into the MMO Fantasy Earth before our boy got canned from that project. The framework of the games are the same, however the world and character design is completely different. We were not originally allowed to make it in 2D, so we were developing it in 3D, but the project eventually fell through. The 3D models that I designed were then repurposed for Fantasy Earth. Sometimes people inaccurately describe Dragon's Crown as a sequel to Princess Crown, which we know is false because Odin Sphere exists. It's actually a misinterpretation of Kamatani's words regarding his intentions for a potential Princess Crown sequel, which yes, was planned as a side-scrolling beat-em-up a la the old Dungeons & Dragons Tower of Doom and Chronicles of Mystara game that Kamatani worked on and enjoyed, respectively. Dragon's Crown was concepted immediately after Princess Crown. It was originally a Dreamcast project. I worked on Dungeons & Dragons Tower of Doom before that, and ever since then, I've always been hoping I could work on something like that again. And knowing this, Dragon's Crown makes more sense. In my original playthrough years ago, now, I was impressed by the artisanship on display, but not particularly taken by the play, especially because I recorded it solo and moved on totally unaware that Vanillaware's action games had always pushed what 2D action combat could be, what a compelling action RPG in a monoplane world could play like. I've never been huge on the side-scrolling beat-em-up genre. I don't like the flat cutouts in pseudo 3D space. I don't like teeing up basic combos. I don't like how it feels like moving up and down is slower than left to right. It's weird in this tiny, insignificant way that chews at my yeah. brainstem constantly, and I've always looked for increasingly impressive 3D action experiences. But the value of Dragon's Crown has less to do with Vanillaware's game design lineage and more to do with Kamatani's career. Princess Crown was his baby, and regardless of how cursed that game is, how its specter followed him for years, it did a lot of good as well. It surely made friendships, fans, and fame, however minor, that gave the guy a name. When given the chance to make a sequel, he wanted to materialize something new, not cropped by whatever publisher's weird RPG kink. He wanted to pay homage to some of his favorite games of all time and greatest artistic inspirations. Look at Dragon's Crown. 
It's gorgeous, woven with the same attention to detail, exuding all the same character as any of Vanillaware's other games, but it accesses a more washed-out palette, a warm but faded aesthetic. It presents a story without any kind of central protagonist but a selectable character of six, none of whom have original stories, but simply progress like the others do, hitting all the same plot beats and only diverging at the end with a simple where are they now scene. It uses a narrator, an actual factual honest-to-god narrator, to exposit about events in the place of active character interactions. The fairy leads you into an old ivy-covered tower. Look at my character. Huh? Look at her hands. She got man hands, bro. This is Seinfeld, bro. You have to save your game at the inn. Actually rest and save progress at the inn. This isn't a typical Vanillaware action game. You are not going on a series of adventures with different characters. You're walking into a book. Of course you are. This is Dungeons and Dragons. Dragon's Crown is thoroughly rooted in the tradition of D&D, which is, in turn, thoroughly rooted in the tradition of Western fantasy. Despite being more meaningfully sourced from existing material and actually paying mind to it, unlike the loose buckshot approach of Odin Sphere, Odin the Demon Lord with a ball and chain indeed, it manages to be a wholly original work for the studio. I don't think the game was a games journalism curio purely for the controversy. I think its aesthetic merits warrant a second look. And we will be looking. Oh yes, George. Firstly, the play. We've established the genre, but if you're not used to playing more than very old beat-em-ups like the Simpsons one or something, that's me by the way, you might not expect the mechanical complexity of the experience. Every character plays vastly differently, so it's hard to universally commentate, but generally speaking, characters can walk, run, jump, perform grounded and aerial attacks, and combos depending on the character. That's all fine, but characters can also perform dashing attacks that send stunned enemies into a wall bounce for further juggling. All characters function something like D&D classes adapted for a 2D side-scroller, meaning they have unique capabilities baked into their buttons, and unique skills you can purchase from the local adventurer's guild. The fighter can protect others with his shield, the dwarf can throw enemies, DPSing while crowd controlling, the wizard can obliterate whole screens of enemies, but happens to be the weakest in the game otherwise. Different characters can perform completely differently depending on the skills they buy. It's too open to comprehensively cover the experience in this kind of video, but also great for people interested in hopping online, picking some fun abilities, and playing with friends. I picked the Amazon in my original run, who mostly combos enemies to death with heightening ferocity as she keeps her streak going. This run, however, I ran the Sorceress, who's often viewed as a support character given her various crowd control abilities, powerful nobility options, and relative frailty. Full disclosure, I'm worse at this title than any of the other ones. It's such a punishing game, so easy to die in a matter of hits by late game, and not every character is equally suited to solo play. The Barbarian is great, but the Wizard, and to a lesser extent the Sorceress, struggle a bit because they're wearing nothing. Or, uh, One's wearing nothing and the other has TB. <laughs> but that's a personal thing. I chose to run it solo and paid for it. Dragon's Crown was built, unlike any other Vanillaware game minus Grand Knight's history but ignore that, for multiplayer. It's a couch co-op game with active players today. It's the draw. And let's not downplay that decision. Vanillaware's games sell aesthetic experiences, and Dragon's Crown is Dungeons & Dragons spun into a very mechanically-minded arcade framework. I haven't even brought up the company's name. Vanillaware. Kamatani called it that because he wanted to make games that reminded players of the timeless flavor of vanilla ice cream, a little old-fashioned, but always good. His studio repeatedly bucked market trends from the jump to high-fidelity 3D graphics to even attempting to break into popular genres. Vanillaware's games were weird from the outset. Grim Grimoire attempting something like vertical Starcraft, Odin Sphere and Muramasa more concerned with pushing the boundaries of the Princess Crown design dock, and here with Dragon's Crown effectively recreating Chronicles of Mistara for the modern age. So to not engage with the multiplayer is actually to not engage with the artistic intent to some degree. Obviously, it's not always possible or functionally necessary. You can clear the game solo, you'll just have less money and more respawns under your belt, and need to recruit the AI a lot, which... 
Well, they're not great, so I'll try to get a game with my friends if I can get them over the uh, enormous chesticles thing. Dungeons aren't all combat, like any vanilla war title, and beat em up game for that matter. Enemies are varied and require different approaches, but stage challenges are also worth mentioning. The game is pilfering from Dungeons and Dragons, so you'll occasionally stumble across a puzzle or a set piece segment of some kind, navigating a small boat through whirlpools or escaping sentient lava on a flying carpet. All very pulpy action D&D concepts brought to life in beautiful 2D animation. You can interact with stage elements, and it's actually relevant to play a lot of the time. Oil catches fire, darkness requires a torch or other light source, physical attacks won't harm ghosts. These challenges are immediately understandable because they're derived from now ancient tropes, but the game does have a few secrets. Stages are riddled with rune words that the player can mouse over with the right stick and you can cast rune magic by tapping into these stages themselves, plugging in a few rune words in a certain order to craft a spell. These range from wealth to health and a pile of other effects, the bulk of which must be unlocked through a local wizard who can teach you more about rune words, preserving the integrity of the source material by making the player key into the world and engage to unlock its mysteries. Pro Gandalf, more like Ganjolf. Dragon's Crown's thoroughness at selling the D&D experience in a side-scrolling framework should not be sloughed off. It's immaculate. I think a lot about Stephen Sondheim, who once said that he held his creative work to three principles. Content should dictate form, less is more, and God is in the details. Dragon's Crown is selling Dungeons & Dragons in the medium of video games, and so it captures a classic within another classic, the beat-em-up. Content dictates form. Less is more, and indeed, the game is a mere nine dungeons, ultimately repeated for those who want something like a true ending, allowing players to firmly grasp the totality of the game instead of offering endless novel challenges, which was on the table at some point, but it was eventually decided that mastery was more important than novelty. Lastly, I don't think I need to explain how detail work is key to vanillaware. Take a look at any shot. The game is played from stage to stage, chasing and acquiring whatever MacGuffins, collect experience, and advance the plot which plays out between dungeons. Eventually, you'll complete the main set of dungeons and be made to run through each clear dungeon a second time, this time taking a second path, technically accessing something like new content with a new final boss per dungeon. You can choose to continue your quest after completing a dungeon, which sometimes results in... Well, that's not fair at all. What do you mean I have only two minutes to finish? That's twice as less as real life! I wanted to ignore Dragon's Crown's controversy throughout the video because I think it's unconstructed to a point. Unfortunately, I found myself coming back to it repeatedly, so here's the short version. Dragon's Crown pissed off a lot, a lot, a lot of people, and mostly in games journalism because of the character design, specifically the sorceress and the Amazon, and a pile of other actually unnecessary designs in game which were highly suggestive. The USA, where most of the criticism was written, is slightly more puritanical than Japan, but it also generally comes from a place of good intentions. There are plenty of people who are reasonably concerned that representing a woman as whatever the sorceress is will give female players young female players, body issues, things that we've seen with the rise of social media in youth specifically. I worked in a daycare for a while, like after school care, and I distinctly remember a couple of children uh, talking about YouTubers they liked and influencers they followed on Instagram or whatever, per their parents allowing it, mentioning to me that they both felt ugly by comparison. And that shit will kill you. Kill your faith in any of these institutions we've built, this future we've built. It's disgusting. The thing is, most young people aren't playing Dragon's Crown. Vanillaware is a niche studio with historically low sales, headed by someone who's basically always towed the line with female body representation, had a history working in adult games, and with a self-admitted sort of arrested development, which isn't a shield against calling him tacky, do as you please, but I'm also not playing video games to brick up if you feel me. So when the game was released, and George Kamatani got dragged up and down multiple different venues for being childish, by journalists with a cause to fight and an axe to grind, and no mind for any of the historical artisanship informing the game, and definitely no consideration for the company's financials, Kamatani's history in the industry, no charitability, 
anything, your boy made a gay joke, apologized when he got backlash because it could have seriously damaged Vanillaware, implied that it was not intended to be a gay joke in the first place and was simply misinterpreted, and kept making his things. I felt the need to bring the controversy up, not necessarily to defend George Kamatani, because he did make at least one mistake, or to drag games journalists, because it's basically the oldest, most boring, and potentially destructive way to handle games journalism in a video, but instead to defend Vanillaware's output and the game's standing as a considered piece of art. And it really isn't difficult if you think about it for a few minutes. The worst explanation is money, but there's weight to it. Vanillaware may have succeeded with Odin Sphere, but many of its other games underperformed or barely allowed the company to break even. Dragon's Crown's development was so long and expensive for the studio, especially stacked up against its previous works, that it demanded cutting the budget for Grand Knight's History's localization, a modern-day Vanillaware title now locked to Japan-only exclusivity, barring emulators and English patches that many people still aren't aware exist because the studio is tiny and places artistic integrity over mass appeal. Dragon's Crown happened to sell incredibly well in the face of the controversy, and maybe a portion of that was Coomers, in quotation marks. But more realistically, it's because they made a fun and interesting multiplayer game that people spun into a culture devil. The allure of the darkness is strong. It's possible Kamatani sat at his desk, grinning ear to ear, finally working with adult characters in the protag role like, this will sell boo billions, but we don't know. And the company's actions historically are commendable. Overall, I've described Kamatani's work as decadent, seemingly aligned with aestheticism, and I did that for a reason. Every one of Vanillaware's games is concerned with visuals, with bizarre proportions and piles of gold and mountains of food, with pleasing the eye. No matter how you look at it, these characters and cutouts may provoke reaction at a glance, but in the broader picture, meld into any screenshot, caricatures of their Dungeons and Dragons ancestors. It is decadent. It is edging on profane, but it's so obviously intentional. This is the first Vanillaware game to lean so heavily into the sexual, something that's very rarely explored in video games because, yeah, publishers don't like games being restricted. There's an argument that Dragon's Crown takes classic material and makes it avant-garde, not only for pushing boundaries within these characters' classical representations, but also for pushing it in the video game market. In my bachelor degree years, or my uh, writing degree years, we were challenged at one point to write about the male nipple or the female jawline, right? Incorporate some kind of sexuality into our writing, which might seem insane at first pass, but is a worthy challenge for a young writer. Sexual content is kind of taboo by design, especially moving anywhere beyond the pure vanilla. You can't broach the subject in public without raised eyebrows. You can't include an intimate scene in a movie or a show these days without people questioning the validity of the inclusion, people are uncomfortable about their bare selves. And that is valid to an extent. We don't get to decide who is and is not comfortable with what material. Depictions of sexuality aren't inherently high art or whatever, but I do think those who react consistently or universally negatively to sexual representation of any kind should reflect on where those feelings come from. Dragon's Crown is aesthetically distinct from other Vanillaware games for a reason. Dragon's Crown does not visually match the other games in the lineage, at least not the fantasy titles. Princess Crown is bright, colorful, cartoonish even, and Odin Sphere walks the tightrope between glaringly saturated fantasy land and warped, disturbing hellscape. Dragon's Crown is largely muted by comparison, relying on spots of color, gradients, and light. The world itself could slot into any work of fantasy from the 70s and 80s, it's just been spun up Kamatani style. Sexuality is at the forefront, far, far more so than the other titles with multiple shots of scantily clad women, NPCs that should not exist. But it would be hasty to react here, especially paying mind to the lineage. Dragon's Crown is successfully performing tradition. Kamatani is inspired by many artists, but the character art in Dragon's Crown is clearly inspired by Frank Frazetta's, one of the all-timer fantasy artists who illustrated for Conan and many, many others. Kamatani mentions him by name regarding Dragon's Crown specifically. These works depict men with obscene, rippling muscles, women with very prominent chests. People are fantastical, decadently painted into frame to exude some sort of idealized vision of humanity, which sure isn't great for teaching young people what bodies look like, 
But that isn't the function of Vanillaware or Frank Frazetta's art or video games writ large. Games were once fairly private experiences and can easily be today. Nobody touched my copies of Final Fantasy Tactics Advance or Pokemon or Golden Sun when I was a kid. Those were my adventures that I bought. Their indulgences, trysts, curiosities, and vanillaware of all companies was never poised to dominate the gaming landscape or infiltrate the mainstream. To hone in on some rogue artistic elements and get upset about bodies is to look at a decadent work and proclaim degeneracy. Isn't that reactionary? Isn't that exactly what the decadent movement's number one hater Max Nordo did? Isn't that what deranged Twitter users with an axe to grind do over modern art? How they react to modern shifts in sexual demographics and people reclaiming their identities in a system that's felt overly constricting and close-minded since birth? You're allowed to find Kamatani's work distasteful, and should feel free to do so. Some of it really is. Being able to tap this NPC with a button is exploitative. This is gross. But crossing your arms and getting huffy at the state of Kamatani's art publicly is fascinating with any knowledge of the source material and the lineage of Princess Crown. Seriously approaching the work from the basis of, this is eroding the moral fabric of our culture, is reactionary. I think there's a separate conversation to be had about clashing aesthetic values across cultures. This stuff only ever hit the market because global markets make money. It wasn't designed for the West, just tapped into some historical Western culture to reclaim a minute fragment of the game's industry's history. Dragon's Crown is Vanillaware's take on Dungeons & Dragons Tower of Doom and Chronicles of Mystara, sure. But more poignantly, Dragon's Crown is a triumphant return to George Kamatani's history, his years playing these games, and working on the former, lovingly raising a long-tired concept and restoring it with modern polish by way of Kamatani's painterly brush and Vanillaware's signature detail work. Dragon's Crown is limited, low scope, compared to even Princess Crown, but that negative space in the design dock is actually the beauty of the work, a return to the timeless flavor of vanilla ice cream. When games didn't need long-winded narratives, just a series of levels and a handful of characters. It's a game about fulfilling Vanillaware's promise. As a new fan, I'm sitting here waiting for the new Princess Crown 4. Vanillaware didn't make the game for me. They made it for themselves, and that's what I appreciate about it most, in retrospect. Vanillaware's history is long and turbulent. A few years ago, I read an interview with Yoko Taro where he mentioned that the games industry must not lose Vanillaware, and back then, having only played through Dragon's Crown, I had no idea what he meant. What I saw was a game I kind of enjoyed and found pretty, nothing deeper, but I see the vision after only playing half of their lineup and looking at the challenges that informed the series. Vanillaware's games make clear, concise statements about the medium that happen to be highly compelling, worthy of a look regardless of your personal aesthetic tastes. In an industry rife with every toxic money-sucking practice laid bare, year over year, and fresh hells every quarter, the few studios that managed to scrape out a small existence through the earnest presentation of an artistic vision, even paying homage to the history of games with their modern releases, are worth your time and support. And at the very least, a second look before you slough them off with a simple too anime, too weird, too cringy, too horny. Art can be challenging to engage with meaningfully, but sheer aesthetic should be met with vulnerability, an open mind to its indulgences, Cross-national, diverse aesthetics should be met with an eye to any unique contributions made. Vanillaware's games are focused on making the player happy, a simple goal accomplished through mimetic desire fulfillment. Don't you want a nice hot meal? To open a treasure chest? To see your desires made manifest? All in ways only the video game medium can convey. They're celebratory of gaming, enriching the player's experience, literally powering them up through engagement with systemic cruft and rewarding, enticing players with sheer beauty and spectacle. It'd be easy to label Kamatani a decadent for his creative inclinations or an aestheticist, someone primarily concerned with presenting art for art's sake. But the truth is, Kamatani is himself. His art is his own, removed from historical movements. After all, a founding principle of aestheticism is a rejection of didactic function, that art serve merely as art. 
but video games are products, or less cynically, experiences made to be engaged with. Kamatani is not in the business of selling walking simulators, and even those maintain a level of physical engagement. His games also sell stories, narratives conveyed through characters, words, and mechanics. They're designed with purpose. Vanillaware's games are not mere aestheticism. They have a primary function, arguably the original function games were created for enjoyably passing time. If you're anything like me and ready to move past being cynical about what you're engaging with, Vanillaware's titles are a good place to start. This is the first part of an eventual two-part video covering Vanillaware's games in anticipation of Unicorn Overlord, their modern-day ogre battle, if you can believe it. Like the games I'm covering, I don't imagine this will do particularly well niche subject matter, so if you'd share around or comment or like or something, I'd be grateful. We've come a long way since, I don't know, seven years now? And I've gotten this far with the help of internet strangers, so thanks for sticking around and see you soon. And thanks to the guest voices, which are, in order, Stumblebee, GC Vasquez, Zach Frazier, Cullen, Brendan Hesse, Couch Moba, and Mara Ganger, all of whom have YouTube channels. Roll the credits. Hey, it's K-Bash. Huge thanks goes out to my $4 patrons. Check them out. Beautiful. And double special thanks goes to my extra generous patrons who are... Adam Welch, Alpha 42, All Snaps, Andrew, Redacted, Arswasser, Azura, Axin Audra, Bear Skeleton, Basement Dweller, Bosch 7, Bear Keeper, BZ Soul, Ben M, Beguile, Big Papa Sprung, Bing Bing Doo Doo Oingo Boingo Time, Blake Against the Machine, Wargle Hargle, Boha, Boom Dead, BH Operator, Born in Shadow, Brandon S, Brandon Hesse, Brios, British Gooch, Cow, Pixar, Can I Cuss on Captain Here, Blasted, Captain Blasted, Captain Wade, C-Dub, Caesar T, Chiefy Boy, Hero Hero, Cordon, Chris Bromo, CLB5000, Cody Golden, Comfy Moogle, Couch Moba, Crash Girls, Crater, Chrono 19D, CW Glass Works, Cynical, Daddy Dagon, Don Dion, Danny Pango, Dakota Storm Jones, Dakey Stag, Swag, David Event, Castillo, Dara, Deco, Dead World, Dead, Dennis Samaya, Destrega, Diablo, Dingus Bat, Doodle Flu, Doug Prince, DJ, Professor K, Dr. Cullen, PhD, The Protagonist, Dylan Coffee, 8 Bit Thug, Elias, Elpio, Elsa, Emperor Pickle, Empty Tenshi, Eric Monticello, Est Medico, Ever Stone Isle, Exa, Gnar, Fail Knight, Forte Noir, Fupa Saiyan, Frankenstein, Frisky Nippler, Frog Vormis, Gato Nero, Gigglebite, Glyph Seeker, Nine Cat, Bobo Bobo, Goose 6112, The Darkest Black, Garcory, Gucci Plant, Asi Ibrahim Tanyurga, Hatsune Miku's Crack House, Arkosh, Demon, Game and Station, Hermit J, Hex Max, Honey Mutt, Horn Tiger, How do you know? Huey, I just took seven grams of magic mushrooms and now I'm lost in the woods. I'm supporting K-Bash just because I wanted to make this part of the video video longer. Inferno galore. Ingenious cloud. IOPG. I punched a sandwich. Irrational. Irradiated cherry. Dice Kyle. It's not bad. It's time to sue. It's not Why? good. Ivy Ruth Langley. Jack Hydra. Jacob. James. Jason Lash. Jaden. J.L. Savarus. J. Davis. J.K. Hedgehog. John Bo the Joker. Joke Frog. Jordan Joyner. Jorzy Burden. Juicy Frog. Jules DLC. Julian My Julian. Kai's at a slow. K. Bash's best K. Keegan Too Cool. Keith the Thief. Kata Snap. King Kuma. Keith. Can I pipe? Quark. K. Kong 2020. Crazy. Crazy. Dark Chocolate. Kumi. Heist. Kyle. KZ Excellent. Lady Dentalia. Lady Weed. Latrix. Laundry Mom. Lego Sid. Lethal Nibbles. Linkle. Little Big Trouble. Loadsome Dung War. Eater. Low Fat Moger. Lucas Boy. Lucky McSmug. Mac James. Lunatic. Loopin the Turd. Magic Meow. Magical Mad Mama Rollin. Mana Pool. Mara Ganger. Hercules. Mugio. Maximilian Wolfgang Knife. Meeple Puppet. Metal Gear Gash. Michelle Citrano. Mike DeVille. Mookie Moo Official. Mikusagi. Moa. Bobby Dobby Big Big Titty Gop, GF Cooley, Monochrome Only, Morgana Black, Modi, Mr. Dodongo, Mr. Whiskey 282, Mr. Yeedy, Dabface, McYoink, Bone, Nido Torpedo, Nico Puzzle Rat, Nifty Rex, Norian, Daridius, Not Nobel, Nuggy, Old Burgle, Old Man Cranberry, Omega Flighter, Omni Nerd Zero, Only LK, Kaplant, BBK, Pandemic Cowboy, Pelagic Undulation, PK Gaming, Popular Hitman, Potato Gaming HD, Prismatic Dan, Pringle Prongle, Pringle Prongle, Probably Not Grady, Fractal and Pals, Project Dark Light, Punch Fighter Champion. Quasar McDougal. Quillwork. Quinn. Rad Punk. Raging Atorexia. Reggie Rodriguez. Renteca Bond. Ricochet Friend Relay. Boywondo. RP Gamer. Ryan Mattel. Ryan Mori Brooks. Psycon Man. Siren Smells Good. Salsa. Salty Smash. Scribe Slendy. Say Say. Sakai No Awarda. Sephirium. Sexy Bionicle GS. Shot. Shinigami. Shintendo. Shut up, Wesley. Silver Bear 909. Sin. Sir Doodles a lot. Sim. 
God! Sleepy Wabbit. Snarf. Sozetta Dad. Suckum Bopper. Suckdologer. Space Lizard. Squidget. Squishward. Star Knight Sky. Storm Strider and the House of Storm. Sublime Cataclysm. Super Dingus. Super Sandwich Guy. Taya Toxin. George Chubbington. Terrence Swift. The Big Buddy. The Clown Prince of Cringe. The Digital Dutchman. The Good Lord has blessed me. Hallelujah! The Green Loki. The Crispy Boy. The Peacemaker Pyro. The Salt Knight. The Nomad. The Real McCoy. Big Dick Mystic. Fresh. Rips Heart Tiggles McGuffin. Tim Lobster. Timid the Writer. Tony Jones. The Legend. Total Play. Travis Edwards. Twiddle Chungus. Tie Guy 9001. Vic. Vacant Plaza. Valen Rich. Venom. Vice Pop. Vic. Walk in, get bright in my bag. Wapoza. Weed Trash. Wayland. Where am I? Widgie. Winter Solstice. Wood TV. Brenchim. Zanny Tanner. Yayro 12. Yashi Chi. Yay Kundo. Your mom, Winky Zachary Face. Zachary Lives. Zachary Z. Zanasa. Zane the Impure. Zane the Pure. Zed Slayer Gamer. Zero Salazar. Sylvan Ray. Zenova. Cyberpunk. If you'd like to help support the show, unlock new long-form projects, and help me keep improving, check out my Patreon. We got lots more videos in store. Stay tuned for more. K-Bash out.